So now in the next uh, final couple of flowcharts, we're going to be elaborating on the core dates. So we'll entitle this next flowchart Core Dates 2. And for the purposes of saving space, I will no longer be doing that original uh, or origination of where core dates came from, let's say. The fact that we have ancestral protists, you metazoa, you get the idea. Um, that's already established in the previous flowcharts. Hopefully you can figure that out on your own from this point forward. So now we're just going to go straight up. What are core dates? What do they consist of? The exact clades and groups and phylas, all that um, specific taxonomic issues associated with core dates. Now that we know what classifies as core dates. So here, first and foremost, we're going to establish something for the first time that we call basal clades. Now, clades are, of course, group of interrelated organisms okay, that share common characteristics. But what does basal mean? This means that these are going to be, from our classification lecture, groups of organisms that are the simplest, that are the roots of these phylogenetic trees, the first of the first, essentially. What we mean by this is that, let me put two examples in your mind. We have example would be the lancelets, which is a type of animal, a group of animals, and also tunicates, which are also specific animals. Now, these specific animals are chordates. But remember what I said about chordates. Chordates are not necessarily all vertebrates or all invertebrates. They're both. The first chordates were actually both invertebrates. Lancelets are the most basal group of chordates, meaning that they are the most ancient, they are the most rooted. So they are basically the common ancestor of all chordates. So this is the, the true first chordate, let's say. And in addition, these are also invertebrates. And that's all we need to know about them, okay? They are invertebrates. Um, specifically, also, forgot to mention, they are also marine suspension feeders. So, remember what we were asking ourselves, why do we have pharyngeal gill slits? Well, that's because our ancestor, the lancelets, the most basal ancestor, the oldest ancestor, the most common ancestor of chordates was a suspension feeder. Thus, chordates have pharyngeal gill slits at some point in their life cycle. It's a conserved, derived characteristic that we see over and over and over again amongst all chordates. So these are our lancelets. What are tunicates? Well, tunicates are also still part of the basal clades, one of the earliest chordates possible. And because they're early chordates, they're actually invertebrates. They were also marine suspension feeders. So that shows you, again, this is a highly conserved, highly derived characteristic that stays within the chordates because the two most basal clades were marine suspension feeders, thus they had gills, thus we have gills at some point in our life cycle. Now, the thing about tunicates that makes them very special is the fact that they are characterized by what makes them so different than the lancelets. Well, we have a big change here, and that is characterized by having, this is going to be a big thing in terms of complexity of organisms, of chordates specifically, characterized by having one set of Hopefully you remember what these were, Hox genes. Very important genes for development. And if you have one set of Hox genes, that puts you at one more set than, let's say, the lancelets. Thus, you are going to be more developmentally complex at the end of your development. We'll see what we mean by this set of Hox genes as we move forward after the basal clade. So these are the two oldest chordates. All chordates are related to lancelets and tunicates. Lancelets, the most basal, tunicates are characterized by this set of Hox genes. More on that later. Moving forward, these are both can these both can be considered, let's say, um, as we mentioned, the vertebrates or the invertebrates. Sorry, the ver invertebrates of the chordate story. And we said chordates contain invertebrates and vertebrates, and that's what we'll classify from this point forward: the vertebrates, the true backboned organisms. These are going to be uh, of the organisms that have the following characteristics, key characteristics of these vertebrates, who are also chordates. Now, the chordate characteristics of these organisms, so chordate characteristics, the big four essentially, so we are vertebrates, right? Our big four chordate characteristics are most evident not at the end of their life cycle or as an adult, but actually most evident during embryonic stages. 
Why are the embryonic stages the big stages of evidence for this? Well, that's because embryonic stages of development are a huge key animal characteristic. If we go back to our first lecture on animal diversity, looking at the development of an organism can tell us so much about its evolutionary history. The chordates are no exception to that rule. Our embryonic stages show our past history of being closely related to the lancelets and tunicates, which are the oldest, most basal chordates that we know. Now, now, in our embryonic stages, do we see pharyngeal gill slits? Yes. Do we see them later? No. That's because our chordate characteristics are most seen as a developing embryo. Now, in addition, as an adult, eventually we get a backbone. So the adults are with a backbone that's very clear from our vertebrate definition. And that backbone can be made of bone or cartilage. So more on that distinction later. For right now, I'm just going to tell you that the cartilage version of this is going to be a little bit older, a little bit more basal, if you want to use a nice phylogenetic term. Now, this is a, a big key here. The characteristic that really makes vertebrates more advanced than their basal, lancelet, and tunicate ancestors is the fact that vertebrates all have two or more, this is the idea of sets of Hox genes coming again, two or more sets of of those developmental Hox genes. So basically you can think in terms of the Hox genes, if you have more, you are going to be more genetically complex. So this increases genetic complexity. If you increase your genetic complexity, you increase your phenotypic complexity as well. Thus you will be more phenotypically physically more complex than your ancestors. And that's what's seen here. We only have one Hox gene set here. Here we have two or more. Thus we are more complex. Thus we have something like a vertebrate, a backbone. Now, that does not go to say that vertebrates themselves don't have basal clades. So vertebrates didn't just turn out to give us the most advanced humans uh, uh, version as possible, okay? The humans did not just come out of nowhere. There were basal clades, ancestral vertebrates that are, of course, more, uh, let's say, more developed than our lancelet and tunican ancestors, but these basal clades were uh, a little bit more on the simpler side of the vertebrate story. The two that are important to remember are hagfishes and lampreys. So something that you should be noticing is that this is marine, this is marine, this is in the water, this is, and the lampreys are also in the water. So vertebrates, chordates, and invertebrates, whatever they may be, had water origins. This is going to be a big transition that we'll see soon enough when we get to the tetrapods. So hagfishes and lampreys, both of them are uh, going to be uh, our basal clades. Why are they basal? Well, that's actually because they are the only living vertebrates verts for ber vertebrates without jaws. So a derived characteristic of many vertebrates is the fact that they have jaws. But the only ones that don't are the two oldest, the two most basal, and those are hagfishes and lampreys. In addition, uh, these guys don't even have a complete vertebra. They actually have a very rudimentary, which just means very simple, very old, uh, not as complex vertebrae. Okay. Vertebrae is the plural of uh, many vertebrates, let's say. So they have a very simple backbone here, um, and that simple backbone is rudimentary because it's actually made of cartilage. Just like I said, cartilage is a sign that this is probably something that's older. If it's made of cartilage, later on it'll turn into bone as we'll see. So that's it. That covers our chordates 2 flowchart. Just remember the idea of basal clades. The most original, the most old, the most ancestral characteristics are found in the basal clades, and thus they give rise to everything else. These give rise to the vertebrates because they were invertebrates. The vertebrates themselves have these hagfishes and lampreys that give rise to everything afterwards, okay? And we're going to look at everything afterwards in the next couple of flowcharts.